had to say my name many, many times. Um, and I get lost in drawing the way that other people get lost in books. In fact, even as a teacher, I have still never gotten that lost in a book feeling, but I know what to say. Um, I used my art as a way to escape the things around me growing up. Um, it was a lot of moves, a lot of trauma, a lot of things that just weren't worth being a part of. And I was mesmerized by art spaces. So I would walk into galleries and just ogle at everything on the wall. And I remember meeting my first artist and I thought that was a celebrity, a superhero. I was one time sitting in a cafe with uh, Stephen King. That was not a celebrity to me. The artist was. The artist was because that person had this ability to create something that everyone could see and feel from with something as simple as a pencil and a sheet of paper. And I aspired to be like that. Um, I sought out all these different art spaces. But every time I left a museum or a gallery, there was something that was missing. It was a void, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it, and I thought that maybe it was because I'm not an artist. I wasn't supposed to be doing what I was doing. I wasn't welcome in the spaces that I was welcome, and it wasn't until adulthood where I started studying systems of racial oppression that I realized, oh my goodness, the thing that was missing was me, and people that looked like me, and people that looked like my family. And I had been so trained by society to not even look for those images that I didn't notice they were missing anywhere but in my subconscious. So when I started to use my art as more of a therapy, I found myself drawing nothing but BIPOC folks and trying to capture their beauty and their resilience in ways that were missing. Um, and the first time I brought my art out, um, I thought, why is this getting put on the wall? <laughs> Who wants to see this? It's something I did for myself. And I got an amazing response um, to just putting a few pieces up in a very small little gallery at Harvard's Graduate School of Ed that was put together by students. And it wasn't until I was in that space, that space where I walked around like, oh my gosh, I don't belong here. And I got all this feedback on not my intelligence, but my art, something I wasn't trained in that I thought you needed to be trained in, that I realized, hey, maybe I have a knack for this and I should share it more. And I started sharing it more with people and that response got even greater. Um, and even friends that I've had for a very long time said, I never realized that none of the art looked like us. I, I never realized that I never saw curls in paintings on walls in museums. I never realized until I started seeing them in your work. Um, and since then, I've just been on this mission to decolonize art spaces wherever I go and to bring that up in conversations, with, whether it's um, picking folks to get grants awarded to them or picking who's going to get awarded or critiquing a show that we put on and constantly bringing up this conversation of who is being represented on the wall who is missing and why. And especially in Worcester, we know it's not for a lack of talent that that representation is not here because Worcester's got a lot of damn talent. It's got a lot of damn talent. So if you walk into an art space, at least here, and it's missing, it's because of a lack of opportunity. All right, it's a lack of opportunity and maybe a little nepotism. But, um, I'll be selling some of my pieces at one of the tables there. I've got prints and Madden prints and originals, and then some of my artwork has been up in this beautiful white room for a while. There's some mixed media pieces in the back. Um, and I encourage people to continue the conversation when you're in any type of artistic space, whether it is with poetry, whether it's a theater, whether it's music or physical visual art, who's missing and why?